Panasonic have just released their first ever full-frame mirrorless cameras, the S1 and the S1R. We got hold of the S1 for the past couple of weeks, giving us a chance to put it through its paces, with our focus primarily being on its video capabilities. Just to clarify, the camera we got to try was a pre-production unit. Our look at this camera is going to be pretty extensive, so we have broken the review into different sections. The body, lens mount, software, sensor, codex, image, as well as a quick reflection on our first time using the camera to create a short video. Let's start with the body. Panasonic have clearly taken inspiration for all of the other mirrorless cameras on the market and attempted to add their own spin on it. The magnesium alloy body feels very well built and is also a lot heavier and bigger than I thought it was going to be, weighing in at just over a kilogram. The body feels great in the hand with a decent grip. The button layout is well thought out with the exception of what I feel is an awkwardly placed record button. It's a tad too close to the EVF and would have been better placed elsewhere. We also ran into issues with knocking the back dial with your thumb, but you can use the lock button to prevent this. The feel of the buttons is pretty good overall as well. The only one I don't like being the menu set, dial and wheel. It just feels a bit mushy and not very nice. You can also rebind the buttons pretty in-depthly, which is great for making the camera feel customized for your own style. The S1 comes with the same set of ports you would expect from most current mirrorless cameras. First off, we have a full-size HDMI port. The fact that we have a full-size HDMI is great. At launch, this port can output 4K, 30p, 42, 8-bit, but there will be a paid firmware upgrade later on to enable the HDMI to output 4K, 60, 42, 10-bit. This is awesome, and we can't wait to see and test this out, but until then, the HDMI output settings are quite limited. Next, we have a USB-C port, which is used for data and power. Next, you have a mic in, headphone out, and remote port. One thing to note about the ports is the fantastic covers. These feel really sturdy and don't flap about anywhere near as much as some other cameras. Once fully pushed out, they stay in place really well. When it comes to media options, you have two choices when recording internally, XQD and SD. This is an interesting choice by Panasonic. XQD is a great media type, but it is expensive and more difficult to find in a pinch rather than SD. At launch, with the codec options you have, you will be able to record video to either media. Talking about recording, you also have three different modes for recording to the cards. Relay, backup and allocation. Relay will automatically switch to your second card when you have filled up the first. Backup will record the same to both cards simultaneously and allocation record allows you to select what media, be that stills or video, goes to each card. Some other nice features related to media are the card lock alarm which will let you know when you open the card door and you're still recording. However, one downside to the card door is that just the overall design of it. It's not the easiest door to open one-handed. The camera also features a huge 5.7 million dot EVF. As far as EVFs go, this is pretty good and also features the same variable refresh rate like the GH5S, which you can switch between 60 or 120 hertz. As do most high-end DSLRs, the S1 also features a top status screen. When a battery is in the camera but the camera is off, it will provide you with the battery remaining and shutter count for your media. Once the camera is powered on, you then have a more detailed readout of crucial information you may need at a quick glance. The rear screen is a 3.2 inch 2.1 million dot touchscreen. The touch feels very responsive and accurate and the screen can get decently bright. The screen can also tilt but can only flip out in one direction, which is to the right. This seemingly impractical design may annoy a lot of people, but really it's not a deal breaker. Otherwise, the construction of the mechanism seems sturdy. The battery is a new type from Panasonic, the DMW-BLJ31, a 3050 milliamp hour or 23 watt hour battery, which is much larger than Panasonic's common DMW-BL19E, which is only 1860 milliamp hours. One nice feature is the hole in the battery door. This would be very handy if you're wanting to run a dummy battery to DTAP. During the shoot, we only had the one battery that Panasonic had provided to us. A workaround for this was to use a 15,000 milliamp hour USB battery bank in our pocket connected to the camera via USB-C. This resulted in us having 72% of the camera's battery remaining and around a quarter of the power on the battery bank remaining. This feature makes shooting all day like we did an absolute breeze when it comes to power. And if you're planning on rigging this up, you could easily power this with a DTAP source battery with a USB-C to DTAP cable. When it comes to audio, the camera features an internal scratch mic and a 3.5 millimeter mic in. However, you can also use the XLR-1 from the GH5 series with this camera. This will give you two XLR inputs and a range of controls for those two inputs. The lens mount on the S1 has sparked a lot of interest and debate. For the S1 Panasonic decided to collaborate with Leica and Sigma and use the new L mount. Previously used on Leica's SL, this mount features a short flange of 20mm, 
an internal diameter of 51.6 millimeters and 10 electrical pins for communication. There are so many good reasons that, that the L mount is going to be better for creatives, the biggest being the shorter flange distance. This means not only are there new and in theory better optical designs possible, but you can also adapt most lenses with larger flange depths onto this mount. This is a huge advantage that Sony's E-mount has provided their users for years now, with adapters being made for EF, PL and even older mounts like M42, where you can pick up and experiment with some really interesting optics. Fingers crossed Panasonic moved their interchangeable lens video slash cine cameras to this mount because it would make switching between EF and PL so much simpler. On the subject of lenses, when we received the camera from Panasonic, they provided us with two lenses, the 24-105 f4 and the 70-200 f4. But for our tests, we didn't want to be restricted just to these two lenses, so we took a punt and ordered in this. This Novaflex EF to L adapter was designed for the Leica SL, but we thought in theory it should work and it kind of does. We did run into a few issues, um, such as the camera saying that the lens had malfunctioned or wasn't recognized. This mainly happened with the Lauer 12mm, but our workaround for this was to shoot externally with the menus up on the camera screen, and this would make the feed out to the Ninja 5 work weirdly. Panasonic are planning on doing an EF adapter, and it will only be a matter of time until other manufacturers like Metabones follow suit with one and hopefully some others. When it comes to native lenses, Panasonic have a roadmap to intro some of the standard full frame zooms, but at release, there will only be three lenses available. The 24-105 f4 IS, 70-200 f4 IS, and a 50mm f1.4. This isn't a bad three to start with, and as long as their adapter behaves well, this shouldn't put people off from early adopting. We have had some hands on time with the lenses. The 24-105 is also extremely sharp, and its IS works really well with the sensor. The 7200 f4 is also decently sharp, but the IS in this lens really, really impressed us. At 200 millimeters, it is rock solid with only a bit of shake when the stabilizer catches up your movement. This doesn't look too natural for video, but for stills, this level of stabilization will be amazing. One downside of these lenses is like most modern stills lenses these days, they're focused by wire. However, some of the issues with focus by wire have been resolved with the software and the camera. In the menu under focus ring control, you can choose between non-linear, linear, and set. Non-linear is your regular focus by wire, which responds to speed. Linear is a more traditional focus style where focus responds according to the rotation angle. And set allows you to set the focus rotation throw to what you would like depending on the application. You can also switch between metric and imperial for the focus scale on the back of the camera. The 7200 also features a clutch mechanism on the focus ring, which when clicked to MF shows you a focus scale with both metric and imperial markings. Next up is the software. The overall menu design is similar to the GH5, but has had a few tweaks. When you try to find something, it is relatively easy, but sometimes they just have weird names. Once you start customizing your own menu pages, things get a lot easier to navigate. In this video, we won't be going into a full deep dive into the menu settings, but we will be looking over some of the key ones for shooting video. There are a few general features that are actually quite interesting. One feature that I was not expecting is sheer overlay. This setting is amazing for stop motion animation on a budget as it allows you to overlay the previous shot so you can check positioning. There are also features like time lapse, stop motion, and the ability to copy settings across cameras if you have a couple of the cameras in your kit and you want to keep the settings consistent. As you expect from Panasonic mirrorless cameras, there are a range of monitoring and recording tools. Let's start with the exposure assist tools. You have the ability to use a histogram and position it on the screen as you'd like. You also have zebras for shadows and highlights, which you can then define the percentage thresholds. You also have HLG Assist, which comes in handy by making the image slightly more contrasty if you prefer exposing and focusing with slightly brighter and a more Rex 709 looking image. Hopefully, there will be the ability to ingest LUTs once the VLOG update is released, so you can monitor or record with those. There are also a range of manual focus assist tools. MF Assist is a punch-in feature, which you can have activate when you're adjusting focus several ways. You can also choose picture-in-picture -picture or a full screen punch-in. If you are in picture-in-picture -picture mode, you can go from three to six times using the right-hand side dial and front dial for finer adjustments. And when you're using full, you can go from three to 20 times. As you'd expect, there is also focus peaking. Within the menu for this, you can change the sensitivity and color as well as whether or not you want it to display while you're focusing. There is also the ability to enable lens focus resume, in which the camera will remember the distance position of your focus when you turn the camera off and on again with focus by wire lenses. There is also a monochrome mode if you prefer focusing in black and white. You also have a level gauge, which is very minimal and a great way to making sure your shots are level. There is also an IS status scope that shows the degree of jitter and what the sensor is doing to minimize the shake on your footage. 
The user interface also features a night mode, and this is a pretty unique feature that you can apply to the EVF back screen. This mode will enable a red color scheme that reduces eye strain and cuts down the amount of light from the screen for scenarios that require it. There are a range of autofocus modes with this camera, but while we did our tests, we mainly manual focused. However, we did have a play with the autofocus a little bit, and I'm not really sure what to think. In continuous AF for video, the camera tracks bodies and eyes really well, but it just doesn't translate into focusing. The AF for stills is good, but the responsiveness of it in continuous video is still nowhere near Sony or Canon. So my advice with this camera is that you really need to take advantage of the great manual focus tools. If continuous AF and video is crucial, this may not be the camera for you. This sensor features the same stabilization as the GH5 but with bigger motors. This is rated for 5.5 stops, which increases to six when you pair it with one of Panasonic's dual IS lenses, like the 24-105 or 70-200 that we had for this test. There are a few different modes for the stabilization. E-stabilization, which is designed for panning, and boost IS, which Panasonic say was designed to take out the micro movements of shooting handheld. However, this mode does have a slight crop. The sensor size is your standard 36 by 24 millimeter sensor. Depending on the codec will depend what crop factor you have, but you can record 4K full sensor, which is great. It also features an APS-C mode, like its Sony competitor, which will allow creatives to use Super 35 or APS-C lenses on the camera when adapting. Unfortunately, there is no V-Log in the camera at the moment. However, you can shoot HLG, but only in the MP4 HEVC codec. If you aren't familiar with HLG, it's pretty simple. HLG, or Hybrid Log Gamma, is, as the name suggests, a transfer function that combines a gamma curve, which is close to Rec. 799, and a log curve, and is designed for delivery straight to monitors or TVs. What makes HLG unique is its ability to look good on Rec. 709, as well as monitors and TVs that support HLG. If you want us to do a full video on HLG, let us know in the comments. You also have your standard picture profiles that you expect from Panasonic. Panasonic haven't rated the dynamic range of the sensor, but here are a few side-by-sides with the Sony a7 III and a Red Monstro. Obviously, this is an unfair comparison, as the S1 doesn't have V-Log, and is no way a representative of the sensor's potential. The Monstro is, as you expect from its name, an absolute monster. Using Red's amazing geoscopes tool, you can easily see where all of the light in your scene sits, within the stops of dynamic range that the camera can capture. During this test, our Monstro was losing a tiny bit of information in the LEDs of the light, but it did manage to hold everything else. When you look at the same areas on the a7 III, you can see the Sony can't handle the highlights the same. And then looking at the S1, you can see the limitations of it currently even in HLG. The light is completely blown out and you can even see the sky starting to lose detail also. Without Panasonic giving us a rating for the dynamic range and no V-Log, it's very difficult to make a comment on this. We will be producing a video once the update comes out, which will include this kind of test again with other cameras on the market. When it comes to ISO, again, our Panasonic rep didn't know the base ISO of the camera, but we've done some tests and comparisons against the Sony a7 III using the amazing Zeiss Otis 85mm as our lens of choice. We lit the scene with a candle and exposed for our model Alex's left side using our Siconic light meter. We went from ISO 400 at f1.4 all the way up to 51,200, stopping our lens down as we stepped up the ISO. On the S1, we shot in Cine like D, and on the Sony, we shot in Cine 4 and tweaked them very slightly in Resolve. I didn't want to shoot in Log on the Sony, as that's a test I wanted to hold out until we have V-Log on the S1. This one looks really clean noise performance wise up until around 12,800. However, there is quite a bit of noise reduction, which you can really see on Alex's face. In comparison to the a7 III, I think the S1 renders nicer color, but isn't quite as detailed as the a7 III when pushed above 3200 ISO. Overall, I would say the S1 is on par with other mirrorless cameras ISO performance at the moment, but could do with some noise reduction tweaks. But I'm sure this is something Panasonic is going to tweak. So, the codex. This is where Panasonic have decided to be very Panasonic-y. Just as they did with the GH5 release, they have decided to cripple the camera at release for video users. At launch, the S1 will be able to record up to 4K 60 4208 bit at 150 megabits a second in an MP4 codec with an APS-C crop mode, or 4K 30 4208 bit in the MP4 codec in full frame mode. All these codecs are long op, and as of this review, there are no all eye codecs. However, you can shoot in the MP4 HEVC, which is 10-bit but only 420, and only up to 30p at 72 megabits a second, 
but this will also enable you to shoot HLG. However, Panasonic will be putting out a paid update which will include the ability to shoot 4K 30 42 10 bit internally and 4K 60 42 10 bit externally, both with Vlog. It'll be interesting to see if they introduce any new codecs with this and what data rates they use, but only time will tell. At the moment, the camera is slightly restricted with these codecs, so I'm intrigued to see what happens during the paid upgrade coming soon. The camera offers a range of high-speed recording options, the highlights in my opinion being the 150p 1080p with a 30p playback base, which has no sensor cropping, and the 50p UHD, which features a roughly 1.5 or APS-C size sensor crop. It will be interesting to see if this crop is still a factor when the new firmware is released. There is also no way of telling what bit depth and chroma subsampling that these formats are in, but I think it would be safe to assume that it's photo 8-bit. But if our Panasonic rep can confirm it, either way I will make sure that there is a pinned comment in the section below. Otherwise, the overall look of the slow motion is pretty nice. But you can see a slight issue, which is that when you go into high speed mode, that you lose control of your manual exposure. This is extremely odd, as if you hit the exposure comp dial on the top of the camera and point the camera at different exposures, you can see the shutter bouncing about. Obviously, this isn't something you want when you're shooting slow motion, as the amount of motion blur could change throughout your shot depending on if your exposure changes in the shot. I'm not sure if this is a bug in the pre-production unit, and I am awaiting Panasonic's response to this feedback. On the subject of shutter speeds, one thing I, which I'm hoping that they can add in a later firmware update is the option of changing between shutter speed and angle when shooting video. The full-size HDMI offers a clean output, which at the moment will output 4K 420 8-bit at 60p or 4K 422 8-bit at 30p. This will obviously change when the new update comes out to 4210 10-bit at 60p, which will make the Ninja 5 an excellent accessory with the S1. Another exciting thing is that Panasonic are looking into the possibility of ProRes RAW eventually being added to the HDMI output, which would not surprise me given Nikon's latest announcements. During our time with this camera, myself and Joe headed over to Bam Bao Brothers, a modern Vietnamese restaurant and bar in Waterloo. We tasked ourselves to create a short promotional film exploring the story of the founders Chris and Ray. You can check out the full video by clicking the link in the top right. When it came to kit, we decided to shoot externally to our Ninja 5, take a range of lenses, the 24-105 and 200 on loan from Panasonic, the Novaflex adapter, the Milvus 35mm f2 and 100mm f2 macro, a Lauer 12mm f2.8 zero distortion and a Helios 44 2M. When recording externally, we also ran into a few issues. The first was not being able to trigger the Ninja with the HDMI, but this is most probably an issue with the Ninja 5 not recognizing the S1 and will probably be fixed once it does. Another issue is when we would use the manual focus assist picture-in-picture -picture mode, it would also be output onto the external recording, which isn't ideal, but something easily fixed in firmware. During the interview setup, we used our trusty Sennheiser AVX ME2 set going straight into the mic in on the camera though it would have been nice if we had the XLR1 here to test it with. You can judge for yourself what you think of the sound, but considering the shooting scenario we were in, which was an extremely busy restaurant, I don't think it came out that bad. We also had the Xeon Crane 3 Lab with us. We'll be doing a full review of that very soon, but we managed to balance the S1 with the 24-105 on it and a couple of our Milvus Primes as well. We also had the Evil One with us for shooting behind the scenes B-roll and kept switching around, taking turns shooting with both cameras. One thing that we spoke about was just how uncomfortable shooting with DSLRs is versus a camera solely designed for video. The Evil One's ergonomics are far from perfect, but if you're shooting video all day, ergonomics are really important. But how cameras are balanced and how you use the body to stabilize when handheld is really important and often overlooked. Obviously, image is important, but people often forget that there is a reason these cameras exist. Well, that's been our first look at the Panasonic S1. Myself and Joe have only used the camera on one shoot, and to be honest, it's hard to get a well-rounded idea of a camera just from that. We like the camera, but until Vlog and the bit depth and chroma subsampling update, I don't want to make a full judgment of this camera as it's a bit half-baked. But once this camera receives this update, it has the potential to become one of the best in its class for what it's offering. Panasonic still haven't confirmed the date and price for this update, so for the time being I would wait, see what happens, see what bugs get ironed out, watch a few other reviews and then make a decision once the camera is at its fullest potential. We will be doing a follow-up video once this new update comes out with our updated thoughts on the camera. Anyway, thanks for watching. This was a really labor intensive video for us, so we'd really appreciate if you could check out the short film we shot with the S1. And if you aren't already, please subscribe and let us know what you think of the S1 down in the comments below.